A lot of what the Reformation was, was a Reformation of worship and a response to errors that had crept into medieval worship, um, you know, anywhere from the 4th century through the, through the 16th century. Uh, and yet, I think what, what, we are, what we have seen develop in a lot of worship theology and practice today is a return to some of that, a return to some of what the Reformers themselves uh, rejected and responded to. And so what I'd like to do is to compare and contrast, to talk a little bit about some of the issues that the reformers faced when they encountered medieval worship in the 16th century, and then show how some of that has in different forms, but uh, by their own admission, returned to, to uh, some of the theology and practice in, in some circles of contemporary worship. And then I think there's a common diagnosis to both and a common solution to both. And so I think I want to kind of conclude there with what I think is the, is the diagnosis and the solution. So I have three or four here uh, problems with medieval worship that the reformers encountered. The first was sacramentalism. Um, ironically, we're right at this, this point in the worship class. So you all are getting a, a, a head start on this. We don't, we don't go nearly into this depth in the worship class. So what is sacramentalism? Uh, sacramentalism is the attributing of efficacy of an act of worship to the outward sign itself rather than the inner working of the Holy Spirit. Right? So the, the, the term sacrament, most people... Um, you know, think Augustine was among the first to at least define what the word means. And, and the word sacrament simply means a visible sign of an inward spiritual reality. So the word itself is not a bad word. Um, uh, we, we do things in worship that are outward, external, visible signs of things that have already happened or that are happening through the work of the Holy Spirit, right? Sacramentalism is the belief that developed over time that those actual outward signs do something to us, attributing an efficacy to the signs themselves, rather than to them being a symbol of a, of a work that the Holy Spirit has done. Um, and that, that, that becomes a big problem that the reformers have to deal with. Uh, in particular, there develops this idea that, that later we come to call ex opera operato, which is simply a Latin phrase that means from the work worked, meaning uh, along with attributing efficacy to the works themselves, there also developed this idea that I just have to do the thing. I just have to go to mass. I just have to be baptized. And of course, they add other sacraments to those things over time. Um, I just have to do those things. And as long as, as long as I simply do the outward sign, I get the grace. The thing is done to me, whether or not I understand what's going on. So it doesn't matter if they're speaking Latin up there and I don't speak Latin. Just, just being there in the presence of the Eucharist, I am receiving grace from that. Or it doesn't matter that the infant doesn't understand that he or she is being sprinkled with water. That has efficacy in itself just by the virtue of the work itself. So that was sort of a, a parallel error that developed um, that can be encapsulated under this idea of sacramentalism. Well, of course, the reformers rejected this for a number of reasons, not the least of which is, is the additional sacraments. Luther and Calvin and others said, no, there's only two, baptism and the Lord's Supper. All of these additional uh, sacraments are added. They're not scriptural. But, but even, uh, even with those two, um, they argued that, no, there has to be a necessity of faith. The, there has to be an intentionality, a sincerity of heart by the worshiper who enters the act. And then it's not the, it's not the act itself that is effective on the person. The Holy Spirit is doing the work, is working the word of God into the heart of the believer. These sacraments are simply external acts. Um, one of the lesser known reformers, Martin Bootser, in his, uh, in his work on reforming worship, um, ground and reason, he calls this superstition. I and mean, he specifically says this idea that you just do this magical formula and you get some sort of zap from God or this thing itself, you know, um, actually affects you. That's just, that's just superstitious. 
Uh, the reformers argue that though the sacraments are a means of grace given to God, right, they, they do have benefit, the reformers argued, they are not effectual in and of themselves. Rather, the benefits of the means of grace to sanctify a person necessitate sincerity of heart, uh, faith of the worshiper, and are brought about ultimately by the inner work of the Holy Spirit. So that's they, how they responded to this whole issue of sacramentality. And, and as you know, I mean, they continued even calling these things sacraments. Baptists, early Baptists called them sacraments. Uh, it's really not a little later till we got squeamish about the term. And I, you could take or leave the term. I understand you know, some people hear the word sacrament and they automatically hear sacramentality. But nevertheless, uh, it's the theology that they reacted against. So sacramentalism, I would suggest, is a, is a problem that the reformers addressed of medieval worship. The second is what is known as sacerdotalism. So what does that mean? Well, sacerdotalism is the belief in the necessity of a human priest to mediate on behalf of the worshiper to God, right? We cannot directly go to God, but we have to go through another human, another human priest who does this work on our behalf and we get the benefits from it, but this other person has to do it. Um, the, the, this, this, you know, some of these things, it's hard to pin down exactly when they crept into the church um, because we don't have a whole lot of documentation during the period. We have some of the church orders and some things, but we don't, we don't know a whole lot. But you know, over time, the medieval church developed an ecclesial hierarchy right, of bishops and priests and deacons all of which they considered were different um, offices and had different roles in mediating between the people and God. Uh, later, there developed a pretty strict and firm uh, clergy-laity distinction. So the clergy you know, are not only elevated because of their office, but they have a sort of a special role that the, that the laity cannot function um, in, specifically in relationship to God. The clergy became sort of mediators between God and the laity, and it develops, you know, by the time of the Reformation, in most churches, it gets so bad that really it's the clergy who are doing the worship, and the people are there just watching what's going on. And because of the sacramentalism and the ex opera operato, that's enough. I just have to be there, and I get the blessing, even though it's the priest doing the worship, and I'm just experiencing the blessing by being in the room. And that's essentially what what occurs over time. Uh, even with music, and again, we don't, we, we can't, we don't, I don't think can pin down exactly uh, how, how this happened, but we do know, for example, in 363 at the Council of Laodicea, which was a regional council, it was not a Catholic council, meaning universal council, uh, but nevertheless, what the Council of Laodicea um, articulated did eventually spread across most uh, Catholic churches. And the Council of Laodicea in Canon 15 specifically says, no others shall sing in the church save only the canonical singers who go up into the ambo and sing from the book. So, you know, why this was the case, they're not explicit, but most people think they were concerned about heresy. I mean, there, there, there was legitimate rationale but beneath their thinking. Uh, they didn't want heresy to creep in the churches. So, you know, another thing that the Council of Laodicea did is it outlawed singing of hymns. We're only going to sing psalms, the council said, and the people are not going to sing anymore. We don't trust them. Only the approved canonical singers are going to do the singing. So once again, with music, as with the Eucharist and other elements of worship, it's happening up in front by trained, approved musicians, and the people are not engaging whatsoever. They're not allowed to. Eventually, they don't even speak the language anymore, so they can't, they can't sing anyway. Uh, the, the, the quality of the worship itself. You know, we look at this period and we think, well, there's really some beautiful music that comes out of the period. You can't deny that. But the problem is that the, that the uh, success or quality of the worship becomes measured by the excellence of the music itself. And so, of course, the, you know, the untrained people would only ruin what's going on up in front. And so we want trained musicians who've rehearsed and practiced, so we have this excellent worship, 
which, which becomes measured by the excellence of the music itself rather than by the participation of the people. So what this really results in by the time you get to, to Luther and the other reformers is worship becoming mostly what the priests did in the chancel, which, in, which you know, interestingly eventually is distinctly separated from the nave where the people are sitting, either by high rails or even in some churches by screens. Like they, wouldn't, they didn't even want the people to, to, to pollute the worship by actually seeing it. So they would erect these screens and the people could only see silhouettes of what's going on up front. You know, that's, that's an extreme circumstance. But at the very least, they would put these high rails and the, and the laity were not, were not allowed you know, up into where the worship takes place. Uh, the people become mere spectators of the worship performed by the priests on their behalf. Uh, Luther, in, his, uh, in the preface to his German Mass, which, as you know, I mean, he specifically writes this Mass in the language of the people. This was unheard of for, for so long. Uh, he, he observes, he says, the majority, he's talking about you know, worship that had developed during the medieval period, the majority just stands there and gapes, hoping to see something new. <laughs> That's how he described late medieval worship. So, of course, the, reformer, the reformers countered this mentality by insisting that each member of the, part, the, the congregation participate in worship. This is the liturgia, the people's work. This is not something just performed by the clergy, just performed by the approved musicians. Let the people sing. Luther said. They should be involved in the singing. They should be involved in the praying. They should receive the sacraments right by the end of the Middle Ages. Uh, the people maybe took the Lord's Supper once a year, and even then, only the bread, not the cup. And they said, no, the, uh, Christ himself said, all of you drink of it, and all of you eat, and everybody should be able to participate in these things. And of course, hearing the word, which means, which is why it has to be in their language. Uh, Luther, speaking specifically of singing in his uh, form of the Mass, said, I also wish we had as many songs as possible in the vernacular which the people could sing during the Mass, for who doubts that long ago these were the cries of all the people, which now only the choir sings or responds while the bishop gives the blessing. So he's specifically rejecting what was going on. This is just happening up there. The people are gaping. Hey, I hope we see something new. No, the people need to sing in their own language. They need to be given the Lord's Supper. They need to be able to participate in prayer and all of these sorts of things. Okay, so sacramentalism, reformers reacted against. Sacerdotalism, reformers reacted against. Third, was a preoccupation with a sensory experience, which develops during the Middle Ages. Uh, medieval Christians really became enamored with the experience of the senses that would take place. Uh, in the worship services, whether it be the architecture. Um, I don't know if you know this, but, but during the Middle Ages, the, the architecture of the, of the churches were designed in a certain way, and the use of, of lighting of candles was designed in a certain way to deliberately keep the nave where the people were sitting dark, and all of the light and brightness would be up front because that's where the worship is taking place. We keep the people dark, and we keep the worship up front light. And it was, it was all to communicate this sort, sort of mystery um, that was involved with medieval worship. Of course, elaborate decorations. And again, you know, there's, a, there's a scale here. Uh, in some churches, it was rather extreme. In some churches, it wouldn't have been. But you get the whole idea of icons and, and, and ornate stained glass and gold plated everything, you know. Um, and even the vestments of the priests, right, that became very, very elaborate. Uh, the processions with bells and ceremonies and incense and all of this kind of thing. Again, varied from church to church, but it was all designed to create this mysterious uh, experience of the senses that people came to define as the essence of worship. If they didn't have all that, that ceremony and the, the incense and the smoke and the and the lighting and all of that, that they wouldn't have felt like they worshipped because that, that became uh, the essence of what worship was. And of course, this is something the reformers strongly objected to. Even Luther, right, who, who makes the fewest changes of all the reformers, even Luther considered those things adiaphora, meaning they're indifferent, meaning those things do not give us any grace. He said only 
those things that are prescribed in the Word of God actually give us grace. Namely, the preaching of the Word, the singing of the Word, prayer, the Lord's Supper, and baptism. Uh, these other things he said, you know, the ceremony, um, the incense, the icons, he says these things are not means of grace. They're indifferent. They're adiaphora. He said in the Babylonian captivity of the church in 1520, we must be particularly careful to put aside whatever has been added to its original simple institution by the zeal and devotion of men, such things as vestments, ornaments, chants, prayers, organs, candles, and the whole pageantry of outward things. That's Luther. He sounds like Calvin. I think he softens that view. This is one of the first things he, he writes uh, about worship. I think he softens this a bit. To, to more of the normative principle that we know today. But early on, he's like, we need to get rid of this stuff because there's a lot of confusion. About 20 years later in, in his uh, work on the councils and the church, he said, besides these external signs and holy processions, the church has other externals that do not sanctify it, either in body or soul, nor were they instituted or commanded by God. These things have no more than their natural effects. So by, by this time, he's saying, okay, we've got all these ceremonies, investments, and things. I think by this time, he had softened it. He didn't say that we need to get rid of them. But he said they, they have, they're not commanded by God. They don't sanctify the body or the soul. They have natural effects, and that's it. They're indifferent. And of course, the Reformed wing... Uh, Calvin, Zwingli, Bootser, they, they argued that if they're indifferent, if they're adiaphora, if God has not commanded them, then we should get rid of them. So that's the big difference, of course, between Luther and, and the others. Uh, Martin Bootser argued that we have no right to invent new forms or to enrich existing forms with ceremonies of human origin. Bootser argued that ceremonies either hid or replaced biblically uh, basically biblical signs in worship. So he said that the danger of adding these things, even if we admit that they're indifferent, the danger is that they distract from the real stuff that God has commanded. And instead of wanting to hear preaching, we want the ceremony. And instead of wanting to pray and sing, we want the bells and smells. And, and, and he rejected on, on that basis. Calvin said in his necessity of reforming the church, while the sacrament ought to have been a means of raising pious minds to heaven, the sacred symbols of the supper were abused to an entirely different purpose, and men contended with gazing upon them and worshiping them never once thought of Christ. He said that's what the pageantry and the, the, the sensory experience uh, leads to. Calvin said, our Lord Christ, and he's actually quoting Augustine here, our Lord Christ, says Augustine, has bound the fellowship of new people together with sacraments, very few in number, very excellent in meaning, very easy to observe. How far from this simplicity is the multitude and variety of rites with which we see the church entangled today uh, cannot be fully told. Right? He's, he's quoting Augustine saying, New Testament worship was simple. The, ornament, the, 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 the ordinances, the sacraments were clear. They were few in number, easy to understand their meaning. And now we've packed so much pageantry to it, all of that gets lost. Right, similar to what Bootser argued. Okay, so sacramentalism, sacerdotalism, uh, preoccupation with the sense experience, all of that together, I would say, resulted in a real individualization of piety. And what I mean by that is that, is that the only real benefit of the corporate worship experience is, that, is the, the, the sacramental experience that can be achieved by the sacerdotal system and the splendor of the ceremony, right? Um, that's why we go. We go to the service not because we understand what's going on or, or because we participate, but because we have come to believe that we can actually get grace from God simply by experiencing what others are doing on our behalf and getting wrapped up in the sensory experience. That's what medieval worship becomes. And of course, the reformers insisted um, that piety should be corporate. It's not just me coming by myself in this dark sanctuary and experiencing this and then leaving. No, the reformers said, the benefit of the corporate body is the corporate body, that we are doing this together, that we are stimulating one another, singing to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, etc. Okay, so that's a, a brief...
perhaps simplistic summary of the problems that the reformers reacted against. Sacramentalism, sacerdotalism, preoccupation with the sensory experience, and an individualization of piety. And what I'm going to suggest, and this is not just from my observation, I'm going to quote directly from the horse's mouths, um, and from a, a really helpful little book that some of you have read by uh, Lester Ruth and Sui Hong Lim called Lovin' on Jesus. It's, uh, the subtitle is A Concise History of Contemporary Worship. Uh, and these are, these are uh, a couple men who are very sympathetic to the movement, but are very honest with what is embedded in the theology of the practice. And so I'm going to quote a lot from them as well. But what I'm going to suggest is that when you look at these problems, sacramentalism, sacerdotalism, preoccupation with the sensory experience and individualization of piety, you see very similar problems have crept into a lot of worship uh, today. So let's go through these. First of all, sacrament, sacramentalism. Now you might say, where in the world is sacramentalism in contemporary worship? Okay, well, it's not in the same places often, although there's some change there I'll talk about in a moment, but um, it's not quite the same, but it's there nonetheless. Much of contemporary worship considers music to be an effectual means through which to experience what they call God's manifest presence. So music creates this experience where I can feel God. And they even use the term sacrament to describe this. So let me give you some examples. Dan Wilt, who wrote in one of those Five Views book, Perspectives on Christian Worship, uh, published by B&H, he wrote the chapter on contemporary worship. He said, so this is someone who's defending his own position. He's defending the contemporary worship philosophy. He said, contemporary worship is creating a place where God is expected to show up, to engage with his people, and to manifest his presence in beautiful ways. Wayne Grudem, who wrote a very influential systematic theology, who himself is charismatic, said, the work of the Holy Spirit is to manifest the active presence of God in the world, and especially the church. Indeed, he says, it seems that one of his primary purposes in the new covenant age is to manifest the presence of God, to give indications that make the presence of God known. Because the Holy Spirit is fully God and shares all the attributes of God, his influence will be to bring a God-like character or atmosphere to the situation when he is active. And, and notably, um, Grudem's systematic theology, different from almost any systematic theology I know of, has a lot of focus on, on worship and applies a lot of this directly, directly to worship. Michael Farley, uh, who is Presbyterian, interestingly, but a little bit um, broader in, in his views, says, sacrifices, he's talking about the Old Testament sacrifices, were tangible means of grace that God used to draw people near to him experientially and relationally, and thus they were a kind of sacrament. If worship music falls within the category of sacrifice, which he would argue, then it accomplishes the same broadly sacramental function. So he's, he's using sacrament, language of sacramentality specifically, and applying it to music. Namely, he says, Music, then, is a tangible means through which God reveals himself and enables us to experience his special presence with us. Okay, so this, they're, they're explicit here. Um, of course, the, the, this is directly tied to um, explicit charismatic theology of worship, which argues that uh, the worship service, the purpose of it, Right, breaking from sort of traditional liturgical forms, the purpose of the worship service is to bring a worshiper through a series of emotional stages from rousing praise to intimate worship, which are two different things. Right, That's where we get the phraseology of praise and worship. They're not the same. Praise is how we get to worship, and it's accomplished primarily through uh, musical style, Th this progression that helps the worshiper to experience the manifest presence of God is engineered primarily through music. Judson Cornwall, one of the first to sort of argue this, 
uh, uh, encourages worship leaders to begin with enthusiastic songs of thanksgiving, which then leads a worshiper to what he calls emotional soulish worship, and then brings the mood to an intimate expression where, quote, a gentle sustained chord on the organ and a song of the spirit on the lips of the leaders should be more than sufficient to carry a worship response of the entire congregation for a protracted period of God. So we're a uh, time. So we're aiming to this time of intimate worship where there's this sort of holy hush and we try to sustain that as long as possible. Uh, so th- this, this whole change in theology of worship uh, from sort of historic practice, Reformation practice, um, and particularly music. Music takes on a whole new role in this way of thinking. I think maybe can be best described by a book that was written in 1993 by Ruth Ann Ashton called God's Presence Through Music. That's the title of the book. We can experience God's presence through this sacrament of music. This raised musical style really to a level uh, that, it, that it never had experienced before, and what Sui Hong Lim and Lester Ruth specifically call musical sacramentality, where music is now considered a primary, if not the primary means, through which God's experience can be encountered in worship. And I just want to read you here a, a quick quote by Lim and Ruth who describe the influence of Pentecostal theology that has led to this. They say, Pentecostalism has brought a certain expectation of experience to the forms of contemporary worship. Simply put, Pentecostalism contributed contemporary worship's sacramentality. That is, and remember, these are guys who are very sympathetic. They're they're very sympathetic to the movement. Uh, That is both the expectation that God's presence could be encountered in worship, right? Would we not all agree that that's just a normal expectation in worship today? We expect to feel God's presence here. That's not, that's not how it's historically been viewed. That's new. And the normal means by which this encounter would happen. What's that normal means? Well, mostly music and, and organizing the music in a certain way. Reshaping, they say, an understanding of God's people praising and worshiping, especially as the people sang. What emerged was the sacramentality of music or corporate song expressed in biblical texts such as Psalm 22.3, which Matt is writing on right now, where God is said to inhabit, dwell, or be enthroned upon the praises of God's people. This biblical rooting of the liturgical expectation for encountering God, active and present through the Holy Spirit, molded how the extended worship sets were to be viewed. In the early days of contemporary worship, a set was not just about having an opportunity to sing songs, it was a journey of being ushered into the presence of God, right? which is significant. Uh, so contemporary worship then be, uh, be, has begun to believe that an experience of God's felt presence can be achieved through what they call emotional flow, the flow of the service, which is largely created through music and This is where the the term worship leader comes from, because this is the person, the chief musician, is it's his or her responsibility to lead the people into the presence of God. Lim and Ruth said, flow should facilitate worshipers having an experience with God. One book, they, 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 they say probably the earliest book to really articulate this was David Blomgren's 1978, The Song of the Lord. Have you seen that yet? Yeah. Okay. Well, this is this is what this is how they describe Blomgren's um, approach. The flow of a service should move continual, continuously with no interruptions. The flow should move naturally using con- uh, connections from the song's content, keys, and tempos, and the flow should move towards the climatic experience of true worship of God. He he gives, in his book, technical aspects for achieving proper flow. The content of the songs in sequence makes sense, having scriptural and thematic relatedness. The key signatures are conducive to easy, unjarring, and smooth transition between songs. The tempos, usually uh, faster to slower overall, with songs that have uh, similar tempos grouped together. The tempos contribute to a... Notice this, the tempos contribute to a growing sense of a close, closer encounter with God. So this is, this is the whole idea of sacramentality. And by the way, I just want to say here by, uh, 
uh, as a little side note, I think this also explains the recent enchantment, especially by the millennial generation, with even ancient liturgy. There, there's been a rise in interest in liturgy, not because it's historic or biblical, but I think because it creates similar sorts of experiences of the senses. There's a similar sacramentality to it. And you see this, for example, in Zach Hicks' book, uh, The Worship Pastor. He recounts his journey from what he described as a kind of default charismatic thinking and believing that God's presence was located solely in the surprising, unexpected, unplanned, goosebump moments of worship. That's what he used to think to what he describes as falling in love with all things liturgical and historical, locating God's presence primarily in the sacraments. I don't think there's any change there in his underlying theology. He's just changing from where he's finding this experience. He says that the sacramental traditions remind us that we can feel his presence in powerful and multi-sensory ways as we touch, taste, see, and smell Jesus through the Spirit in baptism and communion. But later he says, God lifted my head and opened my ears to listen to his spirit's work in the broader church among all traditions. No matter how we worship, he argues, we should build the language of presence and encounter in worship. So I'm, what I'm suggesting here is in reality, the fundamental sacramental theology of worship has never changed. He's just exchanged one experiential theology of worship for another experiential theology of worship. I, I would suggest finally in this one category, and this is the biggest in terms of contemporary worship, I would suggest there's even also a sort of ex opera operato approach to this. Let me quote Lim and Ruth again. They say, as the idea of sacramentality of praise developed, it usually picked up another quality that characterized medieval understanding of the Eucharist, a confidence in its instrumental effectiveness. In other words, they say, the sacrament achieves what it symbolizes. When God's people praise, God will be present. The teachers of praise and worship are confident in this instrumental effectiveness for praise. Ashton's God's present through music. Uh, what she says is praise and worship is one of the simplest forms of entrance into the presence of God. So if you just do this, if you follow these formulas, you're going to enter God's presence. You're going to feel his presence. So there's sort of an ex opera uh, operato uh, perspective there as well. Okay, so that's sacramentality. I think that's one of the biggest. There's, there's a, a, a girl right now writing her dissertation at Fuller, and I, I was hoping it would be out by the time I had to give this workshop, but I don't think she's finished. And what she's explicitly, and again, as a defender of it, tracing this idea of music as a sacrament in, in contemporary worship. I can't wait to see what she, what she does there. Okay, number two, sacerdotalism. We don't have priests anymore, do we? Okay, well, not in the same way as the medieval church, but in much contemporary worship, congregational participation is minimized by the emphasis on performed music on the stage, right? Uh, the the Lim and Ruth again talk about this. They say perhaps a sure indication that associating God's presence with music has become widespread in contemporary worship is the expectation that the worship leader can facilitate the congregation's encounter with the divine by ushering them into the presence of God. Uh, he, they, they give a, um, a story here about John Whitfleet, who is um, a worship professor up at Calvin, who uh, talked about a pastor's conference in the late 1990s. And um, there was a, a pastor who was soliciting applications for the, the musician's position at his church. And the, the, the call for, so he's looking for a, a church music leader. And he was looking specifically for someone who could, quote, make God present through music. That was, that was the job description. I want to hire somebody who can make God present through music. Um, this was the person who would bring the congregational worshipers into corporate awareness of God's manifest presence, is what the language said. So, you know, musicians in the church, and we, we kind of know this, right, have in a sense taken a much more elevated and almost priestly role in the service. It's our job. Who, who gets the blame if people don't experience the presence of God? The priests, the musicians, right? 
Uh, like medieval worship, the quality of worship has become measured by the excellence of the music and the atmosphere it creates. And this has resulted in worship becoming mostly what the praise team does on the stage, which, by the way, is separated from the congregation by bright lights on the stage and darkened congregation. The people have become mere spectators of the worship performed by the praise team on their behalf. And this is interesting. Lim and Ruth talk about this as well. They say there seems to be, have been a dissipating of teaching about the sacramentality of praise, although its vestiges still remain. So what they're saying is, you know, the early charismatics, they, they argue this is a sacrament, we're going to experience God here. And, and that's not the case anymore in a lot of contemporary churches. But they still worship like that. They don't talk like that anymore, but they still worship like that. He says, that they, they say, what has not waned are the root sentiments behind this theology of sacramental praise, a desire to encounter the divine through music and a sense that when God is present, God is, is, uh, God is active in power. All right, we've got to move. Third, preoccupation with sensory experience. Right? Is this not the case in contemporary worship? Much of, much of contemporary worship has become enamored by the visual and the spectacular in worship. Um, I, I uh, downloaded uh, the, the notes from a workshop given by Bob Coughlin at a worship conference a number of years ago on this very subject of the visual. And he specifically says, um, since, since God is completely other, we need to ask, what part of our eyes play in the worship of God? How do we see God? What can we do in our services to help people see God? And he, he, and he gives some cautions about that, including the potential of idolatry. But Coughlin insists, when understood properly and used thoughtfully, visuals can serve to promote true worship of God. And it's oftentimes through these visual and tangible experiences that we create the feelings that people associate with worship. And without these feelings, then we, we don't feel like we've really worshipped. And of course, there's, there's a variation here, just like, this, just like during, the, during the Middle Ages. In some extremes, you've got smoke and lights and video and drama and high volume and all of this, uh, which is part of the core of contemporary worship. I mean, Lim and Ruth specifically say, again, they're not critics of the movement, that contemporary worship unplugged is not itself. You can't have contemporary worship without technology because that's inherent to what's going on. And finally, again, all of this has resulted in an individualization of piety. Individual, authentic expression has been the mark of successful worship. And like with medieval worship, the only real benefit of the corporate, there's nothing really significant about gathering together as the church for worship, except that it's a sacramental experience that can be achieved only by the techno technologically driven, emotionally centered music and the power of a group setting to stimulate emotion. I mean, that's why really the power of corporate worship, right? It's, 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 there's, there's certain feelings that can only be created when, when I'm in a, in a group of people with loud music and, and the sense experience. I can't have that, sort of, that same sort of experience by myself. I just, don't, I just don't get the same thing. Okay, sacramentalism, sacerdotalism, uh, preoccupation with the sensory experience, and individu individualization of piety. Certainly different in a lot of important respects from medieval worship, but I would argue that, the, that, the, uh, that the, the, the core is still there. So really, really quickly, and none of this is new because I, I spend some time on this in, in the worship class, but how do we diagnose the problem? Well, I would suggest the diagnosis for both and the solution for both is exactly the same. So diagnosis. One, derive, what, how, how did it get to this point? Well, I think one, one thing that created the problem was deriving church worship theology and practice primarily or even exclusively from Old Testament Israel. And you think about both, and it happens with both, right? In the medieval church, early Catholic theologians explicitly explained the things that were developing based on their connection to Old Testament priests, for example, right? Altars. The Eucharist becomes a sacrifice. Infant baptism is like circumcision. That the churches become temples with their ornateness, or ornateness. The priests wear vestments just like Aaron, right? And they defended all of that by connecting it back to the Old Testament, right? 
Uh, and, and Calvin specifically said, I mean, he said in his Institutes, what shall I say of ceremonies which, with Christ half buried, cause us to return to Jewish symbols? In other words, the reformers said, what has developed in worship in the medieval period is returned to Israel. This is not Christian worship. Calvin said, a new Judaism as a substitution for that which God has distinctly abrogated, right? God got rid of all that stuff, has again been reared up by means of, of numerous puerile, puerile extravagances collected from different quarters. And he goes on and on. We don't, don't have time for all that. What about contemporary worship? Well, praise and worship, that whole theology, uses the typology of Hebrew tabernacle or temple in its worship theology and design. It, it breaks from the more confessional liturgical structure and it roots that design in emotional flow, but it comes directly from the Old Testament. Um, uh, Eddie Espinoza developed his system from Psalm 100, right? Enter his courts with praise in, in, into, the, into God's presence, all defining that by experience and music. Okay, so I would suggest that's one of the problems, that the New Testament church is different from Israel in some really, really important ways as we see uh, in the book of Hebrews, which is, I think, the solution. Two, desire for sensory worship. Uh, that they, that they, they both, both of these views argue is the essence of what's happening. Whether you're medieval or contemporary worship, the sense experience is the presence of God. And uh, uh, Calvin, again, addresses this. He says, the first thing we complain of here is that people are entertained with showy ceremonies while not a word is said of their significance and truth. Um, and this is the same with contemporary worship. The goal of the worship leader, this is Barry uh, Griffin, again, defending it. The goal of the worship leader in planning and leading a, a flowing worship set is to bring the congregational worshiper into a corporate awareness of God's manifest presence. Okay, so what's the solution? Well, I would say the solution is the same uh, in two respects. One, I mean, I'm not going to go into this too much, is, is the regular principle of worship. If we would just limit ourselves to what the Bible commands in the New Testament for worship, that would solve a lot. But this is where I think also Hebrews is a big help. And we're totally out of time, and I wanted to leave time for questions. Uh, but, but we talk about this a lot in the worship class, right? What, is, what does Hebrews say? All of that in the Old Testament was shadows of spiritual reality that have passed away. Now, when we gather to worship, we are actually ascending to heaven, Hebrews chapter 12, joining with the angels and saints, not physically, Therefore, we have to draw near Hebrews 12 in sincerity and faith, right? In defining the experience by a sense experience, that law, that's Old Testament. We need to come by faith. That is confidence that these spiritual realities are taking place, whether or not we can feel them or not. This is why Calvin said, for if we would not throw everything into confusion, we must never lose sight of the distinction between the old and the new dispensations, and of the fact that ceremonies, the observance of which was useful under the law, are now not only superfluous, but vicious and absurd. When Christ was absent and not yet manifested, ceremonies cherished the hope of his advent in the breasts of believers, but now that his glory is present and conspicuous, they only obscure it. And we see what God himself has done. For those ceremonies which he has commanded for a time, he has abrogated forever. But now they are being brought back. And we need to aim for, Calvin says, simple, biblically regulated worship rather than the external splendor which is pleasing to the eye and agreeable to the carnal nature than what God alone requires and approves, which is, which is less ostentatious.